Do you get yours recording? We are recording in live. Okay, cool. In three, two, one. Shaheen Cheyen in, uh, invented one of the biggest designer drugs of the 90s called Herbal Ecstasy when he was 15, and by the time he was 18, he sold over $350 million per year. Fast forward a couple years, and by, by his 20s, he sold over a billion dollars worth of product. Herbal Ecstasy was a nootropic pill that sparked the smart drug movement, and Shaheen became the king of the thrill pill cult and a very famous entrepreneur at a very young age. Later down the line, Shaheen invented digital vaporization and was the innovator behind the vape and vaporization wave. Shaheen founded Vapor, the first publicly traded vaporizer company. He has sold over $350 million on Amazon, and now he is a leading e-com and Amazon expert helping people create reoccurring revenue using the Amazon platform. Shaheen is the author of his new book, Billion, How I Became the King of the Thrill Pill Cults, which we're going to talk about today. And Chris Voss, the former head of international negotiations for the FBI, said this about Shaheen's new book. Shaheen embodies empathy and he demonstrates it in his approach to life, allowing both sides to experience a true win-win. If you can draw out others' aspirations, hopes, and dreams for the future, you can demonstrate how you can affect change in others. In Shaheen's book, Billion, he shows you how he did it. And he's on the podcast today, you guys. I want to welcome Shaheen to the show. How are you doing, Shaheen? Welcome to the podcast. Excited to be on, Chris. And I know you mentioned my buddy, Chris Voss, who mm -hmm. wrote the intro to my book. What an amazing guy. And I, I always thought to myself, dude, I would love to be in the FBI or the CIA or the, one of those organizations, right? It's every boy's dream. Right. And then I realized you would actually have to police people. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm totally not cut out for that. Yes. And it's funny because I know you mentioned my story and the story with herbal ecstasy and what I've written my book Billion on. And it's funny because... I remember, you know, I left home at a very early age. We were immigrants. We came from Iran mm -hmm. in the 1970s, late 1970s, and landed here. I'd get the shit kicked out of me every day in school. Uh, immigrant, total immigrant story. It was a bad time to be an Iranian kid. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I, you know, I left school, went out on my own, basically living in abandoned buildings, backseat of broken down cars, anywhere I could, oh, wow. yeah. trying, to, trying to find my... Um, fame and fortune. And one of the things I realized, you know, I, I got involved in the electronic music scene back then. Mm -hmm. It was just beginning. The rave scene was just getting right. going in the early nineties. And I realized that not only would I not be good at policing, I would be equally as bad at crime <laughs> because <laughs> it's good. I, you found I, that out at a young age. It's super important, you know, yeah. I think, and, and now I teach people how to succeed on Amazon. I mentor a lot of young people to go who've gone from literally nothing to raising millions of dollars and starting up companies and being very successful. And one of the most important things that I tell them is that you have to know yourself. And what that means is you have to know your strengths, but you also have to know your weaknesses yeah. because it's only with that self-knowledge that you can gain that strength to go beyond. So we talk about like Walter Isaacson's book about Steve Jobs. The one thing that became evidently clear in that book, like some people think, okay, Steve Jobs was an asshole. Steve Jobs was this and that. And you look at Bezos, his, his book is out, Invent and Wander. You look at these guys and people are like, oh, they're assholes. They're this, they're that. But at the end of the day, the one quality that binds them, that binds all successful people, even fighters, if you look at Mike Tyson, if you look at Tyson Fury, who right now as we're recording this is the heavyweight champion, is that these guys know themselves. Mm -hmm. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses, but they have this deep self-realized understanding of who they are. And so did Steve Jobs. He knew exactly who he was and what his purpose was. Mm -hmm. Bezos coming out of D.H. Hutton, one of the big venture firms, you know, figuring out, dude, he knew exactly who he was when he started Amazon and what he was going to do. He was going to take cheap money from Wall Street, mm -hmm. pump it into Silicon Valley and build the world's most powerful e-commerce company. And it's, mm -hmm. it's exactly what he did with that knowledge. So me coming out of Iran, I was super dedicated, but I realized, okay, dude, I'm not going to be good at policing and I'm going to be terrible at crime. You see people doing crime and you're like, 
really, dude? Really? Like people are so bad at crying. But <laughs> at yeah. least I think as a, as a teenager, I had this knowledge that I would not be good at crime. So I yeah. thought to myself, okay, who's making the money here uh -huh. in these raves and this electronic music scene? And it wasn't the people who were throwing the parties. Those dudes were broke, always running from the DJs. The DJs weren't making money because they weren't getting paid. Nobody pays the DJs. It's kind of a rule of underground clubs. The DJs <laughs> always outside just pissed because nobody paid them. <laughs> and the buildings were all break-ins. People would effectively somehow, by hook or by crook, figure out a way to get a key to a building or borrow you know, keys somehow and get in. Or they would just break in through the back door and they'd be throwing these parties. Mm -hmm. Well, I realized very quickly that these parties existed for one main reason, and it was so that the drug dealers could function and have a distribution circuit for selling their pills. Now, wow. of course, I realized, well, okay, that goes back into crime, life of crime. I can't sell drugs, but I want to make money. So what am I going to do? How, before you move on, how did you make that realization? Like for a 15-year-old to realize that, um, you mentioned that, I, and I never actually realized that in my entire life, right? I, I didn't grow up going to raves either. I grew up in Missouri, so much different environment. But um, what made you, it was just like, did you naturally see it? So when I left home as a teen, I dropped out of school. Okay. I left home with no communication with anybody, nobody that I knew. I cut my life off as I knew it. And I was like, I'm going to go out there and burn in my ships. I'm going to go out there and seek my fame and fortune. And I'm either gonna fucking make millions mm -hmm. or I'm gonna die, it's fine. Either way, I'm gonna go out there and give it everything I have. I have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. But where I was, I was like, this is bullshit. I'm not you know, gonna go to school for eight years to learn what, fucking calculus or some shit to, mm -hmm. to, to become a doctor and get a loan and like, you know, mortgage everything. And you know, it's, it wasn't for me. So I went off. And I didn't just go out. I, I had very few belongings, but I had my library card. I had a couple important self-help books. I had Think and Grow Rich. I had a few of the big Og Mangdino books, a, a bunch of the self-help books, the old timey dudes, you know? Right. And I took those books with me and I read them every single day. It didn't matter if I was sleeping in the backseat of a car in an abandoned building, surfing someone's couch, sleeping on the beach. It didn't matter. I would read. And through those books, I learned that you have to become observant. Mm -hmm. Roughly around that same time, I had a mentor. I found a mentor who started to coach me. He was a super kind guy. I write about it in my book that's coming out in August called Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. And by the way, for any of your listeners or viewers, if you guys want, I do have a podcast called Billion and the first chapter is free. You guys can just download it on Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere you go. But I listened to it. It was good. It's very oh, good. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh, dope. Thanks, yeah. man. Thanks. So back to, you know, our story is that I was watching how money was being made and I was watching the flow of money. I was told, Hey, if you ever have questions, follow the money. Mm -hmm. And I followed the money back to the illegal drug dealers, the guys that were dealing MDMA ecstasy. Now here's the thing, the supply of ecstasy, ecstasy being a drug that's difficult to make things like pot or other drugs, much easier to produce and distribute. Okay. Ecstasy is a drug that required more technical knowledge and know-how to mm -hmm. produce it correctly. One molecule off and you get something totally different, a couple molecules off and forget what you have. It could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. The supply was cut off. It was only being made in Europe, in, in England and Holland, where the two main places it was coming from. There wasn't anybody really making it in the United States. Okay. So the, the dealers, their supply had dried up, and they were grumpy. And the people coming to the parties were grumpy. Everybody uh -huh. wanted to have this great ecstasy experience. So I thought to myself, hey, man, if I came up with something that was legal, that was safe, that I could produce for pennies and resell for dollars, I could do pretty well for myself. Yeah. So I went about that journey. And I remember the first day, the first evening, where I showed up at the club. And eventually we got it down to a couple small tablets with beautiful butterflies, and they were gorgeous. But this, at this point, I was making them literally in my girlfriend's bathtub. I managed to get myself a girlfriend. If anybody wonders if you need money to get girls, you don't. I was broke. <laughs> and I managed to get myself somehow a girlfriend. And she allowed me to use her kitchen, bathtub, whatever. And we were making up these goo-filled tablets filled with Chinese herbs that I managed to get somebody to front me uh -huh. from Chinatown. And we were putting them in baggies. And so I filled up a, a baggie full of these things. And I walked up and I was like, dude, sell my stuff. 
Uh And then the drug dealer looks at me, you know, with his Gucci purse or whatever, the fanny pack he had. And he goes, fuck off kid. And I said, (laughs) I said, all right, let me make my case for you. You you have no supply left. You're selling junk because you don't have real drugs. You will probably get arrested when the cops show and show up in jail, Mm -hmm. uh, end up in jail. And there's no future in this for you. Try selling my stuff. If it sells, great. You pay me. If it doesn't, you owe me nothing. Throw it away. Gift it to someone. He's like, all right, what do I got to lose? He was in a good mood. Started selling it. Mm -hmm. By the end of the night, everybody in the club was jumping up, dancing, pointing at me. Now, there was a lot of pills. So there was, it didn't taste good. It was, it was weird. This was the beta. Okay. And the guy comes back to me and he looks at me in the eyes and I'm like, all right, I'm fucked. What's going to happen now? And he goes, kid, can you get me more? How soon? (laughs) And that was it. It was on. We went from one drug dealer to uh-huh. 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000. You, you hired all, all the drug dealers to, to sell your legal pills. That's, That's right. so genius. Yeah. Yeah. Because I learned early on, the big uh-huh. learning, uh, Chris, was that distribution is the single most important thing when designing a product or service. The mm. number one mistake that most people make is that they think that if they create a better mousetrap, the world will beat its way to your door. Right. And that maybe was the case 50 years ago, maybe even longer. That is no longer the case. Nobody cares about you. Yeah. Nobody believes anything that you say. Yeah. The only thing that matters is being able to influence people using Caldini's six elements of influence. And we can go into that as we use that to teach people how to sell on Amazon. If you can tell a better story, and what other people are saying about you, social proof, super effective ways of selling things. Nobody cares if you have a better mousetrap. And here's the other part of that. There are a million better mousetraps out there. There is nothing more effective than the internet to let you know that your idea, your billion dollar genius idea, buddy, maybe isn't so genius and yeah. maybe it's not so unique yeah. and maybe there's 5,000 other people that have come up with the same thing that you have. And it's not the path to riches. So what I did in those days, Chris, was I found that distribution. And once we got to that distribution, I was making millions of dollars. Well, Mm -hmm. the product started going everywhere. Tower Records, Warehouse Records, excuse me. We were selling in health food stores. We were selling in 7-Elevens, GNCs, Urban Outfitters, clothing stores, all over the world, we were in 30,000 plus stores Mm -hmm. and we were making millions or so I thought until one day I showed up at my office and I'm, I'm still that long haired kid, you know, long hair and kind of scruffy. And I show up at the office and the news had broke. We had made pre-internet, pre-Facebook, pre-Apple iPhone, a billion dollars in revenue. We'd broken the billion dollar marker. Wow. And I was having an oh shit moment because I did not know how much a billion dollars (laughs) was. It sounds like a lot, right? But nobody knows really exactly how much it is. I've seen a million dollars before. It's a lot of money, right? I couldn't imagine a billion. I didn't even know what it meant. I didn't know. Was it a thousand million, a hundred million, 50 million? And I was panicking. They, they calmed me down. CNN wanted me on. I did Nightline with Sam Donaldson. Montel Williams had me on a show. LA Times, New York Times. We had two Newsweek covers. We were blowing up. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was a wild ass ride. And I talk about that. I write about it in my book that, you know, maybe by the time your listeners are listening to this, we'll be out. It's going to be out later on in August. So yeah, it it should be fun. And there's a film that's in the works. We've got some folks that are optioning the film rights to make a motion picture, which should be cool. That's what I was thinking. It'd be a really cool, um, uh, a movie as well, um, or series. Uh, what was so back back to the bathtub days making making your original product and your girlfriend's bathtub um what what was inside the original product what what are the chinese herbs that you put in so it was a combination of about nine different plants Mm -hmm. but the primary gist of it was that it was ephedra and caffeine and it was a good combination of ephedra an herb called mahuang 
which, you know, again, for anybody listening to this, don't listen to me. I've got the sophistication of a chimpanzee. Talk to your doctor before you take anything. Neither me nor Chris are medical experts and we're not treat diagnosing or preventing any disease. And I don't tell anybody to take anything or not take anything. You got to talk to your doctor for that one. But I thought it was a great herb. Ephedra is a, one of the, the herbs that you can extract a very amphetamine like substance from called ephedrine and using the herb was a very balanced way the chinese used it for thousands of years and it gave you a really great effect and in combination with some other plants from brazil and the rainforest something called guarana which is a Mm -hmm. a herb they use in uh, it's a a fruit nut type thing that they use in brazil you mix those things together and we mixed mixed a bunch of other really potent herbs together it gave you a really nice effect now of course ephedra is illegal in most parts of the world or restricted to medicinal use only okay but it's unfortunate because it was it was really a a wonderful uh herb in my opinion and and where did you learn how to mix you know you're you're broke you've uh, you're just a kid. You're still in your teens, right? Where'd you learn how to mix these together? And and then, you know, were you guys testing this in the early days? Were you like you and your girlfriend at home? Let's try this one. Let's try this one. Pop this one, you know. So it's true. I was broke, but I was never poor. Okay. And this is the difference. I had knowledge. I had courage. And I had action. Those are the three elements I teach everybody in my course, everybody who takes Amazon Mastery to grab a mastery of. Mm-hmm. I had the ability to acquire all the knowledge that I needed without spending a dollar. Okay. I opened up the yellow pages. I started calling. Sure. A big group of people said, fuck off, kid. Good group of people said, I want a huge amount of money, which I didn't have. But then there were the few, the few that helped me and that w- either weren't expecting anything back or were willing to take it on a deferred basis. Okay. And I did this using influence. I was able to sit down with them, to build rapport, to build a relationship, to show them that I could potentially succeed with what my plans were. And when you're young and you have nothing to lose and you have this air of hustle about you. I mean, Mm -hmm. real grit. I don't mean the bullshit hustle that we see on Instagram with the dudes on the yachts and the helicopters and the girls with the little arrow bikinis pointing to, you know, all the, all their parts. I'm talking about like Mm -hmm. real hustle, real grit. If you see somebody who's really hungry, there's something about them. It's very hard for people to say no to that. Yeah. We, eat out often and we eat out outside. And sometimes, you know, these kids will come and they're selling candy bars or whatever. And sometimes I'll just give them a few bucks just to help them out. But oftentimes I'll just say, no, thank you. And they go away. But every once in a while, I see one of them that you can just tell, you know, his candy box is empty and he is not taking no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can smell it on it. You can smell not desperation, but grit, relentlessness, the ability to stock future success Mm -hmm. and not let up until you get it. It's that the same smell that a predator senses when it's going after prey. If you go after success like that, it's very difficult for people to say no to you. And I had that when I was young. When I was young, I didn't have any money. Yeah, I was broke but I was never poor. Right. So timeline from when you got the idea, you saw that the drug dealers were out of product and you realized you wanted to make something to uh, your first batch selling it to the drug dealer. How long did that take? 30 days, maybe less. That's it. Wow. Wow. I had nothing else to do. <laughs> you were... so it's like you get, you get this idea, right? What, what right. am I going to do? Like start calling friends and having board meetings. No, if I can (laughs) drive down to Chinatown and get some shit, Uh get some herbs. If you don't have it, get some money, buy some, borrow some, rent some. It's the first part of it. You got to get the knowledge. You got to learn how to do it. So I started talking to people. What things do I need to mix? What herbs do I need to get? Where do I get them? Who has them? Knowledge. What's knowledge gives you? It gives you courage. Once we know how to do something, that gives us courage. My friend Wayne Boss, who's this 
Australian multimillionaire who turns around businesses and he's real next level guy. Mm -hmm. He taught us that, you know, he's, he's been a mentor of mine for a number of years now. He taught us that it's really those three foundational steps, knowledge. You can buy it, borrow it, steal it, rent it, whatever you need to to get that information. Once you have that, it gives you the courage. Mm -hmm. Courage is absolutely required and only a byproduct of having that knowledge. Once you have that, you have your knowledge and you have courage, then all that's left is to take action. Without action, nothing else is possible. Right. With action, you take the first step. Now, you might fuck it up. It might get fucked up for you. Things happen all the time. That's where perseverance comes in. You have to be gritty. You have to be able to take a punch and be able to get back up. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. How so... So product, tell us about production. So your, you know, first batch came out of a bathtub and then it sold out really quickly. So what was the first steps for you to, to, um, to start making this more and more and more on a regular basis? Like you're bringing people in and and doing it in a girlfriend's apartment or or what are you guys doing? Oh, you know, so that, that was, there was several girlfriends in those days. (laughs) So (laughs) girlfriends came and went pretty fast. I think, that would have been unsustainable and unreasonable for right, me. Right, sure. But I think what I did and in those days is I found somebody in Chinatown who had a little shop and I bought machines for making capsules. And from goo-filled pellets, we got them down to capsules. From capsules, I found a manufacturer who was making supplements. And I said, hey, can you mix these things together for me and make this? And eventually we got it to the point where it was being mass produced. And because there was so much heat around us at that time for what we were doing, we had four or five facilities going at one time. Okay. It became you know, probably the most successful supplement ever in history, certainly in the 1990s. Right. And what were your margins on that? I think I I saw you were selling them for like $3 a pill. And what did it it cost to make? No, we were selling for $20 a dose, which was five pills. So it was 20 bucks. It was mostly cash business. It was costing me about 25 cents all in packaging and everything. And we, for the most part, didn't have any middlemen except the stores. The retail bought it for 50% off. So we would get 10 bucks. Still, it was printing money. So- You know, something that you make for 25 cents, we wholesale for 10 bucks, we retail for 20, and we made more money than we knew what, what to do with. And in fact, we did all the Lollapalooza shows, the original Lollapalooza shows. Oh, wow, we would okay. make a, a million dollars per show. I write about that cash, million bucks every show. I, I We were making so much money, I didn't know what to do or how to, what, what to do with it. So <laughs> we, I, I sent my guys, I was like, guys, go. They were like, we don't know, we can't get armored cars or whatever. I was like, just fucking go buy some RVs. They were, they, they, I said, you know, I said, go buy buses. They couldn't buy buses. They wouldn't sell it to them. So they were, I was like, just go buy some fucking RVs, get in the, get in the, you know, papers and go buy RVs. So we went out and just with cash, we bought five RVs and we started rotating RVs, bringing back bags of cash and delivering bags of bags of pills, millions and millions of dollars worth of pills and cash coming in from those. Wow. Concerts. Wow. Yeah. There, there had to be a time. So dealing with all those in, in those raves in the early days and all the drug dealers, there had to be a time when, you know, um, think, was there a situation that, that was ever really sketchy that kind of freaked you out or like, Oh, I'm too far deep or I don't like who I'm dealing with in this scenario. Did anything ever come up for you? All the time, yeah. all the time. So you got to remember, I was in my teens. Right. No business school, no high right. school education. No high school, yeah. No family. Everything I, everything oh. I, no family, no, no real friends. Everybody, you know, was cheating, wanted something from me. And so there were often times where people stole, we got robbed. We write about this in there. And there was one notable time, which is kind of interesting, which, okay, so if you, if you guys want to see, I don't know if you do video, but this was me. Yeah. Back in the back in the 1990s, if much you guys different are, like, than today, much you don't even much different than <laughs> today. Uh, Chris is looking at a picture of my book, and it's me in a pink robe. Photos taken by uh, the the seminal uh, photographer artist David LaChapelle, um, who's one of the the great photographers of our time. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting in this throne, and there's a castle behind me, and I had long flowing hair back in those days. But there was a man that showed up to my office, very discreet, black suit. Japanese man, missing a finger, long sleeves. Under the sleeves, you could see tattoos coming out. He was all tattooed up. He had an invitation for a private jet out to Tokyo. 
and a million dollars in cash in a little bag briefcase kind of situation. Okay. And he left the briefcase. And that's all the information I had. <laughs> and I had to fly oh to gosh. Tokyo. Uh-huh. I mean, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to drop a million bucks. And I had to, and that was just their good faith gesture to get me to come out. Right. And I had to come out and I had a partner in Japan at the time. So he kind of vetted it. And it turned out that I was dealing with the Japanese Yakuza, the mob Mm -hmm. in Japan, and that they were very interested in acquiring my entire business. And as it so happened, they were not asking. Oh, wow. And so crazy story unfolded with a showdown between me and one of the mob bosses at that time. Uh And a lot of crazy things happened in those days. I was in the radio, I was on TV in Japan and as well, I'm, I'm here now, but it, it ended well, I should say, but for a moment didn't look like it was going to end well. And again, guys, if you're interested in learning more about that, make sure to get on my mailing list. It's thrillpillcult.com for the book or check out the podcast. It's Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or uh, anywhere podcasts are found where you can read. I mean, the whole story, Chris, is, is, is pretty long, but yeah. it's a pretty exciting story. And, and really what I've done is I've tried to tie in not only my experiences during those days, but to build a roadmap for entrepreneurs and people that are aspiring entrepreneurs or wantrepreneurs on how you can actually get to that level, how you can actually go from say very little or nothing, or just starting a business to millions of dollars in revenue. Cause I've done it. I've done it over and over again. And now I teach people how to do it every day. And I'm super excited about that as far as, you know, Amazon goes and selling on Amazon. Yeah. So that didn't that wasn't enough to scare you out of the business, huh? So you, you just wanted to keep going. Yeah, I'm Iranian. I, I you know, I, I'm a, a child of the revolution, the Iranian revolution. You know, I'm mostly third world. I'm pretty gritty. Okay. I grew up getting the shit kicked out of me in school. I learned to defend myself. It wasn't like today where, you know, somebody bullies you and you go to the principal and they get, you know, kicked out. Everyone gets canceled. You can't say anything. 80s were scrappy. I'd get the shit kicked out of me and I'd go tell a teacher and she'd be like, what'd you do? What'd you do? (laughs) And I'd be like, I don't know. I didn't do anything. He just called me a towel head. She goes, well, see, it was your fault. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the 80s. And then I, you know, I learned self-defense. I trained martial arts. I, I learned how to take care of myself and looking back, it was these experiences that really built strength. They built grit. And so those kinds of events led to a very exciting journey. I always felt like I was a step away from success or failure, but really I began to realize Chris that for all of us, you really are never more than a step away. I don't know who says that. I know somebody uh, wrote a book about that and, and talks about that. One of the authors that I've, I've been reading a lot it's of like books three, f- three feet from gold, right. And right, drinking grow rich or something gold. like that. Yeah. You know? Thinking grow rich is three feet from gold. But if you think about it in any business that you're in any career that you're in, mm-hmm. it's really just one major event could lead to mega success or mega failure. We're yeah. never very far off from any of that. And, and you can see that by all these great artists and celebrities and musicians, uh, athletes who are like at the top of their game. And then the next day they're broke yeah. or, or COVID the- hits and wipes out businesses left and right. That's right. Well, not Amazon businesses, as you not know, Amazon, Amazon yes. businesses have been, <laughs> have been on a, on a, on a rocket literally. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, I mean, and I've seen it back behind the scenes, how many online and, and Amazon businesses that April and May, they had a rough time because nobody knew what the heck was going on in 2020. Uh, but about June, any internet business started to get, uh, started to boom and started in 2020 was the best year for so many online companies. Um, and it's been cool to see for those companies for sure. Um, how long did you stay in the, in the thrill pill business until you decided to, uh, to exit? Yeah, we expanded that. Okay. I grew it to two, 300 different products. We made the okay. first herbal cigarette. There was a bidding war between Philip Morris and RJ Reynolds at the time. And a bunch of the other tobacco companies trying to buy my company. They ended up buying another 
uh, tobacco company that was in uh, competition with us. I didn't want to sell really to the tobacco companies. Mm -hmm. And that product still is the standard for Hollywood studios. When people smoke cigarettes on the set, they're smoking my herbal cigarettes. Oh, cool. And we introduced a, a number of products to the market. And then eventually I got burned out and I exited. I sold the different assets of the company off. And, you know, in recent years, managed to uh, recapture some of my trademarks, some of my assets, some of my formulas. And at some point we're going to be doing a totally new reset of Herbal Ecstasy as a male peak performance brand, oh, which yeah. I'm super excited about. Yeah, but you know, at the moment I'm so focused on Amazon because, so I went on from Herbal Ecstasy to thinking about the problem of smoking. Yeah. Thousands of years since the dawn of time, you know, your caveman ancestor, you know, he'd be clubbing, you know, his, his whatever and dragging it into the cave and eating it. And, mm -hmm. you know, they'd be clubbing each other, but they would be burning something and inhaling it. Right. We've got evidence of this. Yeah. Now, Fast forward thousands of years later, we're still doing that. Even though we know how bad smoke, tar, and carbon monoxide, the three critical carcinogenic cancer-causing elements of smoking are. So I thought about this and I thought, hey, no one's thought through this problem. Let's think through it. And I invented digital vaporization at that time. I patented, invented, wrote the book on it. And I thought, hey, if you could heat up these plants, whatever it is, tobacco, or cannabis to get the cannabinoids to a certain point, you won't burn them. And maybe you'll still get the, those active elements. Mm -hmm. Turns out that if you heat plants to, you know, say around 300, 400 degrees for a period of time, you'll get those volatile elements. It'll feel super clean. It'll feel really nice. And you'll have no smoke, no tar, no carbon monoxide, all the stuff that gives you cancer and that is detrimental to your health. So I went about creating a device. We did some development. I created these things, was making them for between $20 to $40, selling them for about $400. Mm -hmm. And we invented the forerunner for what now are vapes. And it started off as the size of a ketchup bottle. We got it down to a cigar. Then it got down to a, a, about the size of a cigarette. And I exited that company in about 2006. The company went public. A very, one, of the, one of the big success stories pre-legalization. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and what time did you uh, timeline again when you exited um, Herbal Ecstasy and then got into your new company? So Herbal Ecstasy would probably be ended, you know, end of the '90s, maybe yeah. beginning of the of the millennium, and then went into the vaporization thing. That was amazing, very successful. Had an exit from that. And then, you know, this was back in the day. So let's fast forward a little bit to like 2009. Bezos was deciding to open up Amazon Seller Central right. to third-party sellers. Before that, you could only sell books and everything else that was sold on there was sold by Amazon. And these were the days where you could email jeff at amazon.com. I hope it's not bad that I'm giving out that email. I think it's semi-public now. <laughs> and Bezos would get back to you. He would respond to every single email. So I had a number of email interactions with them. We heard through him or one of his assistants that they're opening up the platform to third-party sellers. I'm like, all right. I was coming up with a nootropic pill. And what was really funny is you ever see that film Limitless? Yeah. So years before, Bradley Cooper was partying at one of my houses in Venice and we were just hanging out. And I was like, oh, this is a cool guy before he became ultra famous. And he went on and he did that film Limitless. And I went on and I invented this new tropic, completely uh, oblivious of each other at, at that point. Like we, I was unaware that he was making that movie and I'm sure he was unaware that I was making this brain supplement. Mm -hmm. And so I made this brain supplement called Accelerol, which is now available on Amazon, has been for a while, super high end. And I was going to sell it on, you know, I don't know, on a website or through stores. I got it into retail or by subscription. And then I realized, hey, the, you know, Bezos is emailing everybody telling them, hey, you can start selling as a third party, meaning you can sell whatever you want on the Amazon platform without Amazon and just pay them a commission. I thought that was great. I listed it overnight. I didn't think anything of it. Went to sleep, woke up the next day, thousands of orders. Wow. And I thought, holy shit, this <laughs> <onto> is, <laughs> we're onto something. This is the next big thing. 
And I'm going to dedicate the next 10 years or however long it takes to mastering this Amazon platform. And we did. And subsequent to that, you know, we learned how to do it for clients. I've got Fortune 50, Fortune 500 companies that pay us some ridiculous amount of money to manage their entire portfolios. And then people came to me, Chris, and they're like, dude, I want to make money like you on Amazon. Can I hire you? And I'm like, yeah, but you can't really afford me. You know, they're like, what do you charge? I'm like, yeah, you know, you really don't want to know. So we created this course. And by the way, for, for any of your viewers or listeners, if it's okay with you, I've got a one hour course. It's normally 200 bucks. We'll give it away for free to anybody that's a listener of your show or a viewer of your show. Uh, just so you guys know, you don't have to spend any money to start an Amazon business, to launch your, your business on Amazon. We teach you how to get reviews, how to get your product ranked, how to find a product. The number one problem that people have on Amazon. They're like, dude, I want to sell on Amazon. I see everyone's making money. I hear the stories. I watch the videos, but I just don't have a product. And I tell people that's the best place to be. Yeah. And that's been the focus really, you know, my work these last several years is learning to master this algorithm. And we do it using Caldini's principles of influence. Have you read influence Cal Robert Caldini's book, professor I, Caldini? I have it on my desk, but I have not read it. So oh, it's, dude. it's on the to-do list. Dude, dig in, dig in and um, message me after this. I'll send you my PDF on. I got a PDF that relates it to e-commerce okay. marketing. And, and by the way, for any of you guys that are watching or listening, I'll, I'll send you guys the PDF too. If you reach out, we'll give you all the links below to the, to the course. It's fbasellercourse.com and just check the link or go to shaheenshan.com and we'll share the link to all that with you guys for yeah. free. Appreciate but, that. Thank you. Yeah, of course, of course. So we, we use all the elements of Caldini's influence, social proof, authority, likability, consistency, reciprocity, scarcity. These are the things that you need to do, but you got to figure out how do you translate that to the e-commerce platform and how do you translate that to the language of an Amazon buyer? Google is one search engine. Amazon is a bigger search engine. Why? Because bigger monetarily because when people are on Google, for, as far as e-commerce, let me clarify, as far as e-commerce okay. sellers are concerned, because if I go to Google, dude, I'm just fucking around. I want research. Give me information. I'm the guy who's kicking the tires on your fucking car. Right. If I go to Amazon, the kids are crying. The wife's got food on the stove You're and I need to buy something soon. Something yes. soon. Yeah. So and the other part is I don't fucking believe you. Why? Because you have a vested interest. You're the company. Uh -huh. So you can say whatever you want to say on your listing. It's not going to convert. What's going to convert is social proof. Yeah. What you say about my product, Chris, is more important. And we teach how to build that social proof, how to build raving fans. And you build these companies. Dude, I don't know if you've heard about this. So now... There's over 16 million, we think it's closer to, sorry, billion, closer to $20 billion. Just in the last six months, that Wall Street has pumped into these aggregators and SPACs, these companies that are going out there looking to buy Amazon businesses. They're looking to buy these businesses, roll them up go public and make 30 times their money, 50 times their money. Yeah. So what's happening now? My students are all getting calls. It's like every one of my students is the prettiest girl at the ball. Everybody wants to dance because they've got these companies, these Amazon companies, this real estate that they've built. And this is why I get so excited about this, that I encourage every single one of you to think foundationally. What is foundational thinking? So let me explain. A table with four legs is really strong. A table with one leg is really shitty. Right. You want to have as many legs up to four as possible. Your first leg is going to be your foundation. That's going to be your job, whatever you're doing. No shame. If you got to fucking drive Uber, go drive Uber. If you got an Airbnb, go do that. Whatever it is that you have to do to keep your kid in diapers, to keep food on the table, to keep yourself stable where you don't have to worry, even if you're selling your hours, it's okay. The other three pillars, we're going to get you out of selling your hours. The second pillar, cash flow positive real estate. We teach that too. Now is a shitty time to buy real estate. I wouldn't recommend it. It's a great time to learn about it and a great time to look. Mm -hmm. Second pillar, building cash flow positive real estate. I own tons of real estate where I go to sleep, I wake up in the morning, some dudes paid my rent. Some dudes paid my mortgage, my mortgage more accurately by paying me rent. Yeah. The third pillar, 
You want to have something that's creating compounded interest. You want to have money in the stock market. If you're buying crypto and you know what to do there, I don't know what I'm doing with crypto, so I don't mess with it. I do mostly stocks, bonds, options, futures, those types of things, commodities, right? So you want to have something that's creating compound interest, long-term, short-term, medium-term over time. And the fourth pillar, arguably one of the most important ones, is having an e-commerce business. Real estate is expensive. Build yourself some e-commerce real estate. Sell on Etsy, Walmart, eBay, and most importantly, the most powerful, empowering, more millionaires are made from this than any other e-commerce platform, Amazon. I talk to people every day now that started a business two years ago and now are sitting on two, five, ten, a hundred million dollars just from starting an Amazon company mm -hmm. and doing the right things. And so, and here's the crazy thing. You can have a lot of bad days, but when you have these four pillars, you're good, man. Something happens. Oh, real estate's gone to shit. You can't, you know, the, the market's down. No problem. First off, if you're buying cash flow, you will rarely have a bad day. Because even if your property dips 50%, which rarely happens if you buy right and you're buying cash flow single family, even if it dips 50%, you still have that cash flow. It'll right. eventually go up. And in the meanwhile, your e-commerce business is doing well. Oh, your e-commerce business is down. There's some problems with Amazon. Rarely happens. But if it does, your compounded interest is doing good and your real estate is doing good, right? And if that fails, your job is doing good. It's, it's virtually impossible for all four pillars, if done correctly, to fail. Usually it's one pillar fails a little bit and then it comes back up. And then you spend time reinforcing that pillar so that you have a really good foundation. And when you have this type of foundation, which is what we teach, you can make money doing what we do. We travel, me and my son, I've got a, a seven-year-old who's obsessed with Porsches. So we travel around collecting vintage Porsches. He loves them. He knows all about them. We fix them up. And so we created a collection of those. Um, it's one of the biggest collections in our neighborhood, I like to tell him. <laughs> and we travel and while we're traveling, we've got VAs, you know, most of, most of my staff, over 200 people now are outsourced people in Nicaragua, Venezuela, South and Central America. These are MBA quality people that we hire for 10 bucks or less an hour. Yeah. And they do unbelievable work for us at a fraction of the price. We don't have to pay health insurance, you know, and they're appreciative of the work and we're really contributing to them building families, building societies, you know, so it's a, it's, it's very impactful work in that way as well. And we can go traveling. I travel with my family all the time and I can work from anywhere in the world, which is one of the beauties of selling on Amazon. It is one of the most incredible lifestyle businesses, but it is one pillar in that four pillar plan that you and I talked about. Yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned something earlier and it really stood out. You said when you, I think it was 2009, when you first started selling on Amazon, you decided pretty quickly you were going to spend the next 10 years doing it. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that because uh, when, when uh, 2020 hit, I thought to myself, I'd been an entrepreneur for uh, a little over 10 years at the time. And I thought to myself, what could I have done 10 years ago that could have made me retired um, by now that I missed out on? And one of the things was YouTube. I had a mentor of mine tell me, hey, Chris, you need to start a YouTube channel in 2011. Um, and I didn't listen to him. And then uh, I another thing that I was doing in 2009 also uh, I started selling on Amazon and I sold for about six months and I was like, ah, oh, this doesn't work. This is on to the next thing. Right. And I thought like if I would have stuck with either of those, I would have been in a much different financial position, retired, you know, not retired, but like financially could have been retired sort of thing. And so that was when I was made the decision at that point. Also, I had, um, you know, a few years of podcasting under my belt. And I said, well, I'm going to stick with this podcasting thing for the next decade because I think it's a really great platform and can take me where I want to go. And so what was it in 2009 um, and what was the mentality that you had that made you realize this is the thing and I'm going to put 10 years into it? Yeah. Yeah. If you would have stuck to Amazon, we'd probably be having this on your yacht. Right. With the yes. The, yes. The, you the, and the, I. the real jacuzzi going in the background. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
I was just on somebody's yacht. It was crazy. When you see, and, and you know, it's funny because like the guys that actually have that kind of money don't flex. Like mm -hmm. the guys I know that have the yachts and the planes and all that, you know, they'll call me over, you know, we'll go on the ride. It is so low key. Their worst fear is that somebody takes a picture of them on that thing and, <laughs> yeah, and, they want and to keep Instagrams it. Yeah. yeah. They don't want anyone to know, mm -hmm. you know, money's best made quietly is one of the things that I learned in time. I, I didn't know that when I was in my twenties, but lose, lose, lose a billion bucks. And you'll see, you'll see money's best made quietly. Okay. Best kept quietly. So to answer your question, one of my superpowers, and again, it goes back to knowing yourself, the single most important thing you can do in life, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially is knowing yourself, knowing your weaknesses and knowing your strengths. And for me, I always knew that one of my strengths was, and I don't know why this is, but I'm very good at spotting trends. I just know I can, I can spot a trend a thousand miles away. Very easy for me. And when I saw what was happening with Amazon and I looked into Bezos a little bit more, I was like, hmm, this doesn't look to me like a wimpy, balding dude who's like just this like nerd with this like ha 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 laugh. And, you know, I looked at him a little closer and I was like, you know what? This fucking dude is going to run shit. Like mm -hmm. this is the man. And I'm a very poor employee. So I wouldn't do well. Although I encourage people, if you are young and you are looking for a way in, go work for great people. Go find people. If you can't find Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, find somebody 10 degrees removed from them and go work for free. Eat top ramen and sleep in your parents' basement or yes. your parents' garage or whatever and go work for them and eventually work your way up. But that's that's how I knew. And you know, it's funny, a, a buddy of mine who's a publisher and he published self-help books was telling me there was a guy who would come in every night and you know, his name just was Earl or something like that. And every night Earl would come in after his shift and he'd be vacuuming the floors and, you know, mopping up and cleaning the floors. And Earl wasn't really the janitor. He was, he was a guy that was responsible for putting the books back and everything back in the days where people cared about books. Mm -hmm. And one day after a year or two of being there, he asked Earl, he said, Earl, you know, you can go to your wife and family. You don't need to spend an extra hour cleaning the floors here. Why, why do you come in and clean the floors for an hour every night? And he looked at him and he goes, you know, Mr. Jones or whatever the name was. He's like, Mr. Jones, these will be my floors. This will be my company. And he said, what do you mean? And he said, one day, this will be my company. And sure enough, you know, 10 or 12 years later, the company founders were making a sale. The sale didn't go through. Earl was there. He had moved up through the ranks. Turns out he was just cleaning his own floors. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a fantastic story because... You know, that is traditionally, that's how apprentices learned a trade back in the day. If you wanted a job, you would find somebody uh, as a young man or woman and you would work for them, like maybe the blacksmith or um, the person that run, uh, ran the local pub or whatever. And you would work for free until the point where they trusted you enough to where they could pay you if they could pay you. And then you would learn a master of trade and then you go off on your own and you do it yourself. And that's kind of lost with like traditional schooling these days because um, now we go to traditionally school and the idea with that was you're going to learn a trade there, be prepared to learn a trade. Um, but now that is definitely uh, getting to the point where it's outdated um, because you can streamline that much faster and do what you did, um, learn a trade uh, working with somebody that, that isn't paying you at a young age, figure out how to do that and run that business and then continue on yourself. And by the time you're in your thirties, like early thirties, if you do that model, if you, if you follow that model, by the time you're in your late twenties, early thirties, you can have a substantial amount of wealth. And by the time you're in your late thirties, even forties, even be, uh, you know, financially retired. Um, but that is not what, what taught and what's taught these days, what, which is what you're teaching. Um, yeah, incredible story you've got, Shaheen. And this is phenomenal. I love it. I, and you make me want to go get that book. So I'm definitely going to put that on my reading list um, and up influence on my reading list as well and get that one read quicker. Uh, I'd like to ask you, you know, we could go on and on and on and on, but I'd, I'd like to ask you um, some of your high performance tips. You know, you've been an entrepreneur for many decades, very successful, an author now. 
Um, you're training people to be entrepreneurs. What, you know, what's your daily routine look like and what are some of the high performance tips that keep you going on a regular basis? So personally, there's priorities in life. And I think for me, you know, my priority is always family first. Mm -hmm. Family is number one. Now, if you're at the place where you're a young entrepreneur and you don't have your own family yet, then better for you as far as having time and resources to reach those levels of success. Either way, one of the biggest mistakes that I made was when I was very young was that I did not look after myself. And so now as I'm older, I have much more routines that get me there. So the first is a mental routine, a meditation. I recommend Oculus VR with an app called Trip, which is really awesome. I'm, I'm friends with the people that run the company and I, I recommend it. If you guys have an Oculus VR headset, they're a couple hundred bucks. The app is called Trip. It's probably like 10 bucks or 20 bucks or something. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It gets you into a peak performance flow state in about 10 minutes, eight minutes. And there's nothing that you need to do. It can be totally passive. It's, it's really one of the exceptional things. There's another app called Muse, M-U-S-E, which is a headband, which gamifies meditation. But get into meditation, super critical. The second component is that you want to have time every morning before the world starts, before all the noise and negative energy of people and uh, all the things that demand your attention start to poke at you. And in that time, in that quiet time, you can begin to realize and process some of your most important thoughts. And it could be some time between five and six that I usually take to drink some tea. I've been drinking some matcha tea. We make one called matcha DNA, which is fantastic. So I take my time, I brew my matcha tea, and I drink a cup of matcha tea, especially now I'm trying 90 days without coffee, which is really difficult, but <laughs> matcha makes it a little easier. So I have the matcha tea, then having some type of physical exercise. I love Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is something I've been into for the last four or five years. And Me I'm going to continue. Me oh, too. are you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so I think that's, that's a really great way to get focused for the people who aren't into impact sports, anything that can get your heart rate up. I've been doing a lot of cold baths. I do cryotherapy over at Bulletproof Labs here, Dave Asprey's place, which is awesome. I've been doing cryotherapy every day for the last four or five years, which is fantastic. And just ways to get myself in the flow. And then I have my routine. I take my supplements and then spend an hour with my kid. Now, you know, it could be an hour with my kid, an hour with my wife, but it's an hour where we go to the beach, we go into nature, we go for a swim, and we do something that sets the pace for the rest of the day. So the, the majority of my time is spent thinking. And for me to be in the flow, in the peak optimal state that I need to be in order to create the wealth, the success, the happiness that I need, I need to set the stage for the rest of the day. And I do that. And it doesn't mean that you won't ever have a shitty day. I have great days. I have shitty days. It's part of being human. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that when you do have a difficult day, that you have the tools to know how to deal with it and how to understand it. And, and meditation is really one of the things that gives you those tools. And which is one of the, the reasons actually with my Amazon mastery course is that I share all the latest hacks and tricks and tips of how to get in that peak performance state, be it meditation, cold therapy, heat therapy, red light, which a lot of us are experimenting with now to get to that point. That's, uh, uh, I agree completely. I meditate every morning. I'm a big fan of it. It's very important for our minds and our psyches these days. It's funny. You mentioned Dave Asprey. I actually met him this weekend, just on Saturday and, oh, yeah. uh, I went to a biotech conference and heard him speak and got a little chat in with him while I was there. Um, yeah, that's, this has been a fantastic podcast. I, really want a movie to be made about your life selling <laughs> selling herbal ecstasies but i think you're working on you know you're you're working on some deals to possibly make a movie or a series right yeah there's a there's a film in the works right now nice incredible any idea when that might be released that's anyone's guess but okay. as long as you know they can work it out and find the right 
person to cast as young me, then I'm good with it going. <laughs> the hippie version of you, right? The hippie version of me. And then when is your book, uh, when is it released? Yeah, so the book's out in August. It's called Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Call. I'm holding up the book for any of you guys that are listening to it. And for that, you know, you can go on to thrillpillcult.com, join the mailing list. We'll let you know when it comes out. I've got an audio book also that's going to be coming out shortly. Happy to send that to you when it's released, Chris, if you prefer audio books. But again, you know, guys, the first chapter is there. You can download it for free on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podcast Attic, uh, iHeartRadio, anywhere podcasts are found. Just look up Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. And we also have a podcast, which I should get you on at some stage too, Chris, if you're open to that, called yeah. Hack and Grow Rich. You guys can make sure to join us. You can join us on Instagram or YouTube. We've got a YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe. We've got great guests, uh, people like Chris Voss, Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a lot of great people, Keith Ferrazzi, never eat alone, Jay Samet, disrupt you, uh, Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor. We've got a lot of amazing guests on there and we're hopefully going to get Dave Asprey on there too, talking about biohacking. So it's going to be very exciting. So make sure you join us so you guys don't miss that. And Chris Reynolds might be on there too, if we were lucky enough to get him. Of course. Anytime you want, my friend, I'm happy to come on the show. Uh, okay. Shaheen, this is fantastic. I really appreciate the time, your time, um, sharing your story with us, diving into your book and your story. And like you said, go listen to the first chapter of Billion on one of the podcast platforms. It's really good and it will entice you to, uh, to want to read the book for sure. And again, Shaheen, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. And listeners, we want to thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, we'll share the one-hour course on the course notes, Chris. So I'll give you all the links to that. And, yes, actually, yes. Yeah, we could share that with any, anybody who wants the one-hour course, normally 200 bucks, absolutely free. You can go to shaheenshayen.com, spelled S-H-A-A-H-I-N-C-H-E-Y-E-N-E.com, or fbasellercourse.com. Just reach out to us, tell us you saw us on Chris's podcast, and we're happy to share that with you absolutely free. Perfect. We'll wrap up there again. Thank you, Shaheem. And thank you, listeners. And we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody.